Today's episode of The Overwhelmed Brain is brought to you by Casper. Visit casper.com forward slash brain and use the promo code brain to get $50 towards select mattresses. Terms and conditions apply, but you got to check it out. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello, welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. I am Paul Coliani, a personal empowerment coach. And this is the show where I read your questions and help you tackle life's toughest challenges. I want to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and your self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. That goes for my guest, too. Today I have a guest. (laughs) He's a co-host. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. All right, like I said, we have um, a co-host today. His name is Matthew Bivens. You've probably heard him on the show before. If you're a first-time listener, then you've never heard him on the show before. (laughs) And he has his own podcast called Having It All. It's A.L.L. means Abundant Loving Life. And uh, I think that's correct. I hope I got that right. (laughs) And uh, I have him on the show every now and then because I consider him a great coach, a great guy, and a great person to bounce things off of. Uh, because he just has a lot of wisdom, and I appreciate people with wisdom. I appreciate everyone, but I appreciate hanging out with people to not only, um, like I said, bounce things off of, but also to get his take on some of the things that I talk about on this show. As you know, the show is about emotional intelligence and strengthening your self-worth and self-esteem. It's also about honoring yourself, um, you know, your personal boundaries, your values, uh, everything that makes us up so that we can protect what I used to refer to as our castle walls. Like we have this castle, which is our being, if you want to call it that. And our castle walls protect uh, somebody from getting, trying to get in and destroy our home, destroy our being. And I like to create a life where people do not get into your castle and destroy your being. I don't want that to happen for you. I want you to be able to honor yourself and at the same time be vulnerable, be able to uh, speak authentically, not walk around as a victim, uh, worried about what the world is going to do to you, and instead show up the way you want to show up uh, so that you can create great relationships and have uh, great friendships and romantic relationships and even great relationships with family. Who would have (laughs) thunk? But uh, the reason I have Matthew on the show today is because I want to talk about um, processes. That sounds kind of boring, but processes on how to go through personal growth yourself. Uh, And what I mean by that is that when something happens in my life that, I don't know, depresses me, upsets me, angers me, I have a process. I go through, I mean, it's not like a step-by-step, although it could be, I could probably break it down, but I have my own process of how I figure things out in my life. And I also have a process when I receive emails, when I receive messages on how to break down what the actual problems are in someone's message. Because someone might write to me and say, hey, I'm having a problem with my mom, and every time she yells, I, I get upset, and you know, I have to hide for days and not talk to anyone when it's really a problem with um, self-esteem, self-worth, something else that maybe this person didn't develop as a child that may have to do with mom or dad or anyone in their life or something else. But it's not necessarily about, oh, if mom was out of my life, things would be a lot better. It's about what can I do for me so that I can show up differently, so that I can gain the knowledge, gain the learning, gain the healing that I need so that I can get to the next step, you know, next phase of life here so that I'm not affected by my mom. Because if you can show up not affected, then anybody can be anything and you'll be okay with it. 
because you'll have thick castle walls that no one can get in. At least, you know, you let the trusted people in. You let uh, people in that you feel safe with, that you love. And those are the people that can walk around inside the castle or, you know, however you want to look at it. But you also keep up the castle walls so that the, that the enemies or toxic people stay out. I don't, I don't want to use the term enemies, but I'm thinking of the old times with knights and maidens and things like that. But the analogy tells you to uh, keep yourself protected from bad or toxic elements. You know, let the drawbridge down to only those that are safe to cross. And to have the strength, the courage, the confidence to pull that drawbridge up so you don't let other people in. I mean, that's kind of an underlying metaphoric philosophy that I use. doesn't work for everything, but in the case of boundaries, I like to see it as my castle walls are impenetrable. doesn't mean I'm always just stubborn and <laughs> I don't have any leeway with anyone. It just means that eventually, if someone's too toxic, I have to pull up the drawbridge. And I think that's a smart thing to do, is just to be aware of the toxic element to protect yourself. It doesn't mean you treat the world as a scary place. It just means you walk with a sense of knowing that you're protected because you're going to protect yourself. So anyway, I could go on and on with that. And this show isn't necessarily about boundaries. But uh, the reason I mentioned all that is because Matthew and I talk about our process and what we do when we get a message from someone. Where does our mind go? What do we think of when I read something in an email and somebody mentions a subject that they think it is, but I might go to a different place and say, ah, it's probably more to do with this, whereas some people may not see that, which is what I'm good at doing is taking things apart and finding out what's exactly underneath that. Why is this happening? Where can we go with this that it would lead to a change in you? And my underlying philosophy is as long as I have these castle walls protecting me, and I'm willing to stand up regardless of the consequences and protect those castle walls, then the right path is usually revealed. Otherwise, we stay in defense mode trying to protect ourselves from all these attacks because we let the wrong people in, we're in the wrong environment, and so on and so on. So for me, that's just one element of my foundation. And uh, for you, it might be something different. But I, I fully believe in honoring your boundaries, staying in alignment with your values, keeping out the toxic element whenever possible, and of course becoming the person that isn't so affected by so many things in life. Because not everything is a threat, but sometimes we look at it as a threat because of the way it shows up in our life. So we just have to be careful and try to figure out what is really a threat and what is really us overreacting. And I think that's good to figure out for ourselves. So without delaying any further, I'm going to go directly to where we were at a coffee shop in Georgia, where we had a discussion about how we do our process of figuring out where to go with a problem. Like I said, if you have a problem, it might be something to think about. If you have a problem today that you want to figure out, you know, where do I go with it? What, what's the root of this problem? How do I even think about it? Where do I start? As we're talking you can think of some things that might help you find a starting point to help you resolve, or at least get on the path of resolving a challenge in your life. So here we go, Matthew Bivens and I at the coffee shop. I'll be back when we're done to say some goodbyes and um, give you my final words. Well, it's been a few months since we got our Casper mattress, and we are digging it. In fact, uh, we went to a dirt track to watch my girlfriend's son uh, do motocross racing, which is really cool. It was over the weekend. We actually set up a truck tent and then blew up an air mattress. Now, sleeping on an air mattress <laughs> after sleeping on a Casper is an entirely different experience and was certainly something we had to get used to. However, we made it through the weekend, and then when we got home, uh, that it was really late. We took a shower, and we collapsed, and we just sank into our bed. 
Uh, and it was perfect because the bed just formed around us, as it always does. Because all the Casper products are cleverly designed to mimic human curves, providing supportive comfort for all kinds of bodies. And you know what? We spend one third of our life sleeping, so why not spend it comfortably? The original Casper mattress combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface with the right amounts of both sink and bounce. And I tell you what, after sleeping on an air mattress, <laughs> there's just no comparison. And that's not all. We actually had a memory foam bed before our Casper mattress, and I could not wait to get rid of it. I did not like it, and it was a lot more expensive than our Casper and I cannot believe that my girlfriend paid that much for it. But uh, once we got rid of it and got this, we watched it unfold. It was really cool. And uh, we slept on it that night. And almost immediately, we were just smitten. <laughs> we were just happy because now we had a new mattress to sleep on. Casper's breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulate your body temperature throughout the night. And get this, you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. That's right, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, in 100 nights, they'll pick it up for free. I mean, they deliver it for free, too, but they'll pick it up for free, too, if you don't like it. So it's definitely worth 100 nights of great sleep, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I want you to go to casper.com forward slash brain and use the promo code brain, and you'll get $50 towards select mattresses. Hey, there's a reason they have over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars across Casper, Amazon, and Google. Casper is becoming the internet's favorite mattress. Why not make it yours? Go to casper.com forward slash brain. Use the promo code brain. Terms and conditions apply. I think it's helpful for people to have a process of figuring out problems. And when we look at these emails that we get and we we think, okay, how how could I help like this first email, Mary, solve her problem? Um, I have my own process that I've never really thought about. Like I'll, I'll read through the email and I'll highlight some things in my mind and I go, you know, Mary's talking about this. However, she mentioned this one little thing in this one little sentence and she just kept going and that's where I'm focused and she's focused on this entire other thing. So have you ever thought about your process when you read through these emails or the messages that you get when you're working with people that write to you or coach with you or things like that? Yeah, and I was aware of my process just yesterday because I, I did a, an episode on my podcast where I answered a listener email. And so what I, what I did is I actually wrote out what I wanted to address and it was very, it was pretty organized because what I, I did similar to what, what you're sharing that you do, I sat down and I read through the email one time and just sort of sat with the feelings that came up for me when I was reading what she was going through. Um, then I went back through it a second time and I just pulled, I copied and pasted, I pulled, you know, sentences or fragments of sentences and I just put them in a list and I said, these are the things that stand out to me. And then I talked about each of the things that stood out and why. And so like you said, sometimes the email might be heading in one direction, but there might be one little word or one phrase or one sentence that to me was indicative of what might be really going on. And so I was able to pull that and pinpoint on it. Uh, because I think that the way that we, the words that we use are very indicative of how we experience the world, how we see the world, how we experience ourselves. Absolutely. So if you, can, if you tune in to how people say things, what they're saying, you, you get a lot of insight. It's interesting you say that because I've studied communication probably in different ways than most people study it uh, from the dysfunctional aspect <laughs> of my childhood and bringing that into the world and being really careful of what people say and what they mean and trying to interpret it and trying to understand it. And then learning it for real reading books and things like that. But uh, just the word, like, like you said, with the meaning of uh, the word sad, for example. Like, I'm sad today. Now, they could mean a number of things to a number of people. But if somebody says, I'm, I'm sad that I lost my job, we might apply our, we usually do, apply our own meaning to it. Oh, you're sad that you lost your job. So, you know, my immediate reaction to that is, oh, money. 
So you must be sad that you're losing this income. And somebody else might say, well, I had a great position there. And it might have been more about status. Or it might have been more about um, our mission. You know, I was on a mission and we were going to save the earth. We were your charity water thing or water charity, whatever that is. Oh, yeah, from a couple episodes ago. Like you're working at this charity or, and you really love it. And then you get fired because they don't need you or you get laid off or whatever. Um, so this, this idea that this is what I, I learned about uh, mind reading in NLP and hypnosis. They say, you know, there's one of the violations of communication is when we mind read. And so we kind of have to a lot. We have to make assumptions in language a lot. Uh, the problem with that is that we make our own assumptions. Yeah. And we don't interpret it always correctly. And this leads to arguments. This leads to misunderstandings. But let me bring it back to what you were just saying. And this process of looking at someone's issue, listening to their words, reading their words off the email or any message that you get, and breaking it down in a way where we don't mind read, for one, and we can, maybe you and I, Matthew, and other people out there that are used to being in a helping role of some sort, we have enough references where we've worked with people and dealt with things in our own life where we can go in a general direction that's probably correct. And I, yeah. think, I think that can be more accurate in life when you've worked with more people with more issues because I don't know how many times I even interpreted uh, people's issues and thought they were one thing and turned out to be another thing. And so we could get into that really deeply on some other day, but the idea be behind figuring out how you process someone's problem, even your own problem, I think is important. And, and you said something key, your own language sometimes can be very uh, helpful to know how you're wording things, what words you're using. Give me an example. Uh, I, I gave you an example of sad. Is that what you mean regarding language? and? Outcomes? Yeah, so and when we get into Mary's email, um, there's a couple things. And there's another email as well that you, that you shared where I think it's, a, it's another clear example. It, it might be the words, the way that we emphasize certain scenarios. So if, if you've had challenges with relationships and, and you say, you know, um, I'm terrible in relationships or uh, I've had a hard time with relationships, you're describing the same thing, and, but those, those are two very different ways to describe it. You know, one of them is you're putting the blame on yourself. You're taking all the ownership and responsibility. The other one, the other way of saying it, I have a hard time with relationships, it might just be stating something without you feeling guilty around it. So it's things like that. And that may not be the best example, but when we get into it, I'll be able to kind of show what comes out for me because I know for myself, like I, I used to be big in journaling. And I would journal different things. And then maybe weeks or months later, I'd go back and read it. And I could really get a sense of, of where I was emotionally and how I felt about myself or another person or about life, what my perspective was at the time based on not just what I wrote, but how I described it. Hmm. You know, so it may not, it, it might, I might be talking yeah. about a, a fight with, uh, with another person and with my significant other or something. And in rereading how I described the fight, I can, I can sense, man, I was very guilty. I was putting so much guilt and blame and I felt shameful and that it just comes out in the words that I chose to use. Whereas if I was in a different frame of mind, if I was looking at it from a different place, if I felt differently about myself, I may have described that same event in a very different way. That's a great example, actually, what you just said. And uh, it reminds me of something, a little side story. When I was 13, I wrote uh, in my journal, we were told to journal for our class. So every class I would journal something about what was going on in my life. And almost every single entry, because after rereading it when I was in my 20s or 30s, I said the words, I'm hungry and tired. <laughs> <laughs> almost every That's entry. Funny. I'm looking at it go, what does that mean? Does that mean I wasn't taking care of myself? Does that mean somebody wasn't taking care of me? And it was very enlightening. It was, yeah. it was very enlightening. It did lead to kind of a breakthrough in my life. So I really like that you mentioned journaling. I think it can be very helpful to look at your history and go, okay, what, what's my trend? What's going on? What are the patterns in my life that maybe have something to do with what's happening today? So what happened to me was I was often tired. 
and I couldn't figure out why. And I, I always thought it was something that, you know, some sort of medical condition. I mean, I went to doctors. I, I, I really thought there was something going on. Was this when you were uh, a kid or a young adult? or? Well, I was always on? tired as a kid. Okay. I was always tired and hungry as a kid. And then when I was an adult and I found this old journal. Oh, okay, okay. I was like, well, that's interesting because I kind of still feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> What's that mean? I'm not always hungry because now I have more money. I have a job and I can eat all the time. But it did have, it did really highlight something in my life that I needed to take care of, which was that always tired thing. I didn't think about it. It's been happening for so long that I just got used to being fatigued. That was my general state of being, being fatigued. And I finally talked about it. Oh, this might have been into my, well into my 30s. I finally talked about it with my wife at the time. And this was, it was so enlightening for me. I said, you know, I eat three meals a day. I get up and I eat the good breakfast that we're supposed to eat. And then I eat the lunch at the time we're supposed to eat lunch. And then I eat dinner and I go to bed. I thought I was eating healthy and I thought I was doing the right thing. And she goes, not everyone has, has works on the same schedule. Not everyone works with three meals a day. I was like, what do you mean? I've never heard this. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't anything I'm familiar with. And she goes, some people eat small amounts throughout the day. I was like, What? And so that never occurred to me. I was always told three meals a day. Yeah. It's in every textbook, I think. And so I was like, well, what does that mean? Okay. So I started making these small little, I started snacking throughout the day in a healthy way. Changed my life. So it changed everything. It, it really made me realize that it wasn't about eating at a certain time and a certain day. This is for me. And I'm, I'm not giving this advice to anyone. I'm saying this is what worked for me is that. Sometimes what we're told to do <laughs> isn't always necessarily the perfect thing for us. And if for me, I took that different advice and said, okay, I'm going to start eating more small meals throughout the day. And it worked great. I, I kept that energy level going. Apparently, I had a high metabolism or something. It just kept burning that fuel. Yeah. So that made me feel really good. So I really like the idea that you said journaling. And um, I'm probably going off topic here, but only, I'm going to bring it back unless you have a comment on that too. Have you ever found... Like journaling has helped you in the... Oh, I mean, I found journaling beneficial in a lot of ways uh, in, in how it relates to what we're talking about right now with this process. Um, it just gives me additional insight into how my, my mind works, how my emotions come to play, you know, especially how my emotions can color a situation that I'm going through. Because that, that to me has been, has been big, particularly somebody who I've considered myself emotional but i don't show my emotions and i didn't when i was younger and going through stuff and i didn't know how to process it so i would be feeling all sorts of types of emotions but they would be totally bottled up and so when i got into journaling that happened for me around my mid-20s and college early 20s when i was in college and kind of continued for a few years after that's where i could let stuff out mm. and so then going back and reading them, it gave me just great insight into a whole bunch of things. So as we're reading Mary's email and the other emails, I put myself back in that space of when I was just curious about what I was pro processing and going through and how the journaling and reading my words and reading how I describe something, how that really helped to turn different light bulbs on within me. Like, wow, okay, I see it now. I, c I can see it from a different perspective. And that might simply be the act of reading something like that. It, it could be, you know, Mary, for example, might go back and read this email that she sent to us and be able to extract the things and get new insights on her own story that she just totally. shared. Because maybe there's that, maybe the act of reading, it processes the information or the experience, the emotions in a slightly different way. I mean, you might have more formal training in that area. Is there any is there any credibility to that? What you said is absolutely correct. In fact, I hear it from people that um, they write back and say, wow, uh, when I wrote that to you, because some of these emails are like three or four months old, they're not that old, but they're old enough where time has passed yeah. and, and your mind has gone through processing and changing and, or not. I mean, things may be exactly the same, but the, just like what you said at the beginning, the way you worded them is very revealing of where you were, what space you were in at the time. Yeah. So... I've learned and people have told me this that wow when I wrote that you know I was in this space and the more I hear that the more I realized that all all this space this emotional state that you're in 
is always temporary. And this is why I, when I hear from people that are close to suicide and they want to hurt themselves or they're cutting, it feels like it's never going to end, but it, it does. So I'm just going to throw that little tidbit in there, uh, in there is that uh, this is always a temporary thing. Even if it's six months long, it's still a temporary thing. It's still going to pass. Yeah. The, the mind doesn't stick with static thought constantly. And if you want to test that out, this is what I told my sister once, then all you do is go somewhere and meditate uh, on one subject for as long as you possibly can. Hmm. Even if it's the worst thing you can think about, like, oh, I'm going to meditate on how sad I was that I, that relationship broke up. All right, I want you to stay focused on that for as long as possible. Your mind's going to wander. Yeah, it it's, will. It's going to go somewhere else, and then you're going to have a hard time holding that thought. So this is the state of the mind when we allow it to be. This is why I'm always saying just jump into your sadness. Just jump into your fear. Let's experience the whole thing. Now, it's interesting what you said about um, what you do to say. You said it had to do with uh, Jennifer's email, which we may actually get to first because, oh, yeah. One of the things that journaling does, and I have a feeling you're going to agree with me when I say this about when we started broadcasting ourselves, is that as we talked about ourselves and our situations, like when, I, when I'm on my show, I like to share with the listeners what I've been through. As I do that, new stuff comes up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have insights and aha moments as you're recording, as you're broadcasting. Yes. Yes, exactly. So I have learned that this broadcasting, this podcasting platform that both Matthew and I are doing and a lot of other people are doing have allowed us, you know, because we're vulnerable, because we try to be authentic, because we try to share what's going on in our lives, that it's actually accessing parts of ourselves that aren't necessarily thought about at other times until we get into it. And... Um, this is what I've noticed is that people, when they share something about themselves or they're making small talk or Jennifer's email we're going to talk about in a moment and the process that we go through again, uh, is that what I have often found is that there's a lot of filler words. And there's a lot of filler information. Hey, how's the weather? Did you see that movie? Which is all great. Good stuff to build rapport. But I really like the idea of when and I can only speak from my experience and maybe Matthew you can agree or not when I'm sharing something about my life that happened in my life I'm accessing it from a little different space than I was before which means I'm approaching it a little differently than before instead of having what I like to call the I know syndrome like well I already know what happened to me there and there's nothing I can do about it and there's nothing that can change and I don't have any feelings about it and I'm going to be mad about that for the rest of my life I already know I'm where I'm at with that so I'm not going to address it anymore and then we stop talking about it in any other way or we've told our therapist 20 times 300 times the same story over and over again uh, and it's just repetitive but instead of thinking about that what I'm going to do is I'm going to read Jennifer's email because it's a shorter one and this will cool. help with yeah. the processing of this and the reason I want to read this email is because, um, well, there's two reasons, because I want to help Jennifer. And the second reason is because if maybe if you understand how Matthew and I process information and how we look at it, that it might help you figure out your own problems. It might, it might help you stop and go, you know what, if I wrote this down and I had to answer it myself, what would I tell this person? Oh, my gosh. So that that mode of thinking comes up between my wife and I all the time. So my wife is a balanced lifestyle coach, and she she works with people. She coaches people on all sorts of different things, and you know they're they're mostly focused on lifestyle and and how you can create a healthier lifestyle. But of course, emotional things come up. It, of course, you know challenges come up, and so she's in this great coaching role, and she's able to see past the words that people are using see past and really get to the meat you know she's kind of like she's surgical with it you know to, mm -hmm. to quote denzel from <laughs> from training day like she's surgical with that so i know she can do that so then when we're going through something or when she's going through something and she's stuck i'll say babe what would you what would you tell a client that they were going through that yeah. and it just it changes the mindset 
she just switches over into coach mode and then she's able to see through all the stuff and get surgical on herself. Yes. And it's incredible. It's like, yeah, if Jennifer received this email from her closest friend, what would her feedback be? Yes. Now, I will say, I tell people, you know, be your own coach, be your own therapist. Not that that's the resolution, but at least it helps you look at the situation because you do have a lot of inner wisdom. You have a lot of inner, inner resources that you can access. You've been through a lot yourself, probably. And what would you tell this person? Because that's what I go through. What would I tell this person? Well, I mean, if it were me, if I had my own problem, what would I tell myself? And then some of the, and this, I think you can agree, Matthew, some of the answers I get, I don't want. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's part of the reason why I don't do that on myself all the time. Because, like you said, I have the inner wisdom. I already un- know. I just don't want to face that answer. Yeah. Because the answer means that I typically need to take some sort of action that makes me feel uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> well, let me read Jennifer's email. And what I'd like cool. you to do, um, Matthew, is as I'm reading this, maybe you can interrupt. I mean, you may not, but... Cool. And then you can say, okay, this is where my thought process went, right there. Awesome. I love interrupting you. Great. Perfect. <laughs> oh, we got the right environment for that. All right, so this says, uh, I would love to get some advice on or perhaps even a suggested podcast to help me. I've been single for about four years, and I notice a habit that I have that I think is keeping me single. Uh, I think that I seem to overtake conversations. So this is a good one. We are talking about communication. I don't mean to. Cool. Let me. Be, okay, let's go back. Mm-hmm. So a habit that is keeping her single. So mm-hmm. when I think of that, one of the first things is I'm, I'm wondering if and I've already read through the whole email, so I, I kind of can, I know ahead, but it makes me think maybe she's putting the, the blame, I guess you could say, on why she's single on external things. That's the first thing that came to my mind when I read that part, like a habit that's keeping me single. Like, okay. Okay. So I, I love that, that you went big picture. I often do this. I go big picture. If I zoom out of that a little bit, because if we zoom in, oh, I've been single for four years and I have a habit that is keep, keep, keeping me single. Okay, what's the habit? Let's talk about the habit. That's a zoom in. But you zoom yeah. out and go, okay, there's a, there's a habit that's keeping me single. Something external in the, uh, that, that I'm doing or that I'm saying or that I'm... Yes, because that's what I'm, I'm thinking. The, you know, when you have some sort of habit, it's something that you're doing, something that you're expressing, something that you're saying. But that habit is the result of something going on internally. And I'm, I, I t- tend to go back to what's happening internal. Hmm. So it. that's, that's keying me in like, okay, she's saying that it might be an external thing, but I'm very interested in discovering what's going on internally. Okay, great. So you've already got your platform or at least your starting point. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just sort of keeping that mental note. Like, okay. okay, so that's a mental note. Not, not necessarily, okay, from this point on, I know it's internal. I'm going to go from that point on. No, I already believe it's internal. Okay, so I you always have believe, a starting point. Then. Yeah, yeah. So that that's sort of my my perspective. Okay, is that you know it, it, these are internal things that that we experience, and maybe we think it's external or it's somebody else, it's somebody doing something. But in my opinion, it almost always has to do with how we're relating to ourselves, because I like thinking that way because then it brings the power back to you. Great. Somebody can't do something to you. They can't force you to do anything. It's you that are, end up making some sort of choice. That puts you in the, the mode of responsible, responsible for um, what's going on, but also in control of what's yeah, going on. Which is a, a, a great thing, particularly when you feel like you don't have control. So totally. anyway. No, we, that's, good, that's good. I'm glad you interrupted with that thought um, because this is one of the things that if you wrote this yourself, you might be able to kind of analyze this and extrapolate yeah. that. Yeah. Now, you do have some foundational knowledge in this area as far as the self-help that you've gone through, the personal discipline that you've applied to yourself to get through some hard challenges in your life, the challenges that you've faced giving you more inner wisdom. So this is also from that perspective, from that pool of references that you have in yourself. But, Absolutely. But we all have it. Yeah, we do. We all have it. We've all been through a lot in different ways and different aspects of our lives and different times of our lives. So I'm just highlighting this with Matthew because you can do this for yourself as well. So that 
if you are in a, stuck in a situation, then you can also maybe write this down and figure out where you are too. But I'm going to go on. I have stopped interrupting conversations to have input. So she says that um, she has a habit that keeps her single. And it has to do with overtaking conversations. I'm just kind of recapping here. I have stopped interrupting conversations to have input. I noticed I did this a lot, and I could understand why, why, why people thought it was rude or I was rude. I know it all stems from my inner child. Okay. So th- that sentence to me, I was like, wait a minute. I was not expecting that. Right. I was not expecting you to talk <laughs> about your inner child. And then she goes on to say, which I am working on. So that kind of came out of left field. I'm very curious as to what that is. And we don't really get a much more insight on that, but that was kind of an interesting thing to stick right in there. Yeah, and the first th- place I go is like, okay, that, that stems from my inner child. My assumption is that she's saying that when I was a child, this is where it developed. This is where it started. Inner child is the child we bring us with us through our adult lives and what we learned as a child and the perceptions and the beliefs and the fears and dysfunctions that we developed as a child and we bring them to our adult world and to adult relationships so i i go there with that cool and that gives me some insight that it's probably from childhood yeah at least her perception of what's going on all right which okay so i know it all stems from my inner child which i am working on i really struggle with relationships I also seem to shut myself off if I feel people aren't investing their time in me. So that, to me, is the, the two sentences of the whole email. Oh. I really struggle with relationships. Because initially, she's talking about overtaking conversations. And then that, to me, is a sort of the surface level thing that's happening. That's the scenario. That's how whatever she's dealing with is being manifested. She just feels like she needs to overtake a conversation. And then she says, I really struggle with relationships. Interesting. So I'm wondering, okay, we're getting deeper. And then she goes on to say, I also seem to shut myself off if I feel people aren't investing their time in me. That to me is very telling. Telling of um, struggling with relationships. Struggling with relationships. Shutting yourself off is putting up that, that defense, not wanting to be vulnerable, not wanting to expose yourself because maybe this goes back to the inner child. Maybe... She has has had experience of being vulnerable with somebody and getting hurt, getting taken advantage of, having her, you know, emotions taken advantage of in whatever way. So she's saying that she shuts herself off if she feels that other person isn't maybe meeting her halfway. She says investing their time in me. So giving her the, the, the time, the emotion, the attention that she feels she needs or expects or wants. If that's not happening, if she sees it not happening to the other person, there's a shut off. Mm. So those two sentences to me were the, it was like we got into some stuff to get there. What's interesting is it, I look at my own references of life and this is how we look at these things, right? We go, okay, how can I reference something in my life to relate to this or re- reference something in my client, uh, uh, one of my clients' lives or my family's life? Where I go with it is my mom uh, when I grew, when I was growing up, talked a lot, talk, 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 talk. She would talk so much, and this might be part of my uh, past journaling. <laughs> she would talk so much that I would get tired. She would drain me, and sitting in the car with her, I'd be like, uh, I, I can't even form a sentence anymore. I'm just so drained. I don't know how to keep up with the conversation. I don't know how to talk. And she would talk, and that was her personality. However. Like I said, where I go with this is, okay, you know, I've thought about my mom's behavior and why she did that. You know, is it a problem? Is it a dysfunction? Is it, you know, is this an issue in the world? And I'm glad we've had the conversation about how deep communication can go. Because if you're talking and talking and talking and not connecting any of your inner internal state with your your conversation... Like, you know, when so-and-so did this, I felt really bad. And actually go there. And I felt really bad when he said that. When you go there, you have a tendency to connect with yourself and be more present about what's going on. Instead of, and I'm going to put this out there, it might be offensive to some people. Instead of just filling the conversation with a lot of fluff. Yeah. 
And uh, this is what my mom did a lot. It was a lot of a lot of fluff, a lot of talk, a lot of you know. I look at this. This is really a sensitive area for some people um, because some people do talk, and it's not a problem, and it's constant talking. But there are some people out there that dominate conversations. I might be doing it right now. <laughs> 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 and uh, I notice it in myself sometimes. And um, when that happens. I wonder if they even care what I think, what I'm saying. So I, I have a little bit of, I don't know what you call it, a self-awareness, I guess, self-empathy, self, you know, not empathy, but self-awareness in the sense of uh, am I continuing an interactive conversation or am I now putting the, the brakes on their involvement in it? Yeah, I get that. So I'm, I, I have to be aware sometimes. And I'm always a quiet person. Yeah. I'm always a quiet person until something interests me. And then if you get really passionate about it, so on and so oh, forth. Oh, I, I, I absolutely can relate. I had a listener to my podcast. He reached out to me. He said, you know, I've helped him. I gave him some feedback on an email. And then he's like, all right, it's my turn to give you some feedback. And he said, I listened to your interview with so-and-so. And you totally dominated that conversation. <laughs> oh, nice. He said, I've heard your, your episodes with Paul. And there was much more give and take. You guys who had a conversation. But when you were interviewing this other person, you just totally took over. And he's like, it was, it was like you didn't trust them. Mm. And so, you know, initially receiving feedback like that, I was, I could sense a little bit of defensiveness. But then I was like, okay, am I really, did I not trust? And I went back and listened to part of the interview and thought about it. And I think there's an aspect of if you get me rolling on a topic that I'm interested in, I go. And I also do believe there was a, an aspect of not trusting them Interesting. In, in, when I looked back on it because, you know, feeling as if I had special experience in, our, in the topic we were talking about and I didn't know whether she did. So I assume she didn't. Hmm. And I just and I think that created a little bit of, uh, of, of not fully trusting her. So when I think about Jennifer's email, who knows, that might be an aspect of it as well. The dominating conversations, meaning there's an not fully trusting the other person. Uh, because, And I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have shared that feedback to Jennifer if I didn't receive it and if, if a part of it didn't resonate with me. Because there was definitely a part of me where I'm like, yeah, I don't fully trust that, that she could spar with me in that conversation and go back and forth, back and forth. Because I didn't know her experience, I assumed. So I do think that, w that with Jennifer's email that um, I'm just going to address you directly, Jennifer, that there is more going on than simply the interrupting of conversations. But explore that. Explore whether or not there's some, some uh, trust challenges between you trusting the person that you're talking with, maybe trusting that they're competent, that they have a proper amount of experience or intelligence or whatever to be able to have that back and forth conversation with you. Um, but Jennifer, I really think that when you talked about it stems from your inner child, you really struggle with relationships and you shut yourself off. Those are the things that I would key in on. One of the things that I was talking about with my mom is, is something you just did was uh, how would I feel if that were me and why would I do that? If I were Jennifer, why would I do that? And, and you're talking about why would you interrupt yes. someone's conversation? Yes, because what you did was empathize with her in a way where you stepped into yourself in a, in a time that you did that. That somebody told you that you were dominating a conversation, for example. Yeah. So that's where I go. Is This is with my mom. She's, she's always talking, always talking. So one day I tried on, if I were my mom, why would I do that? I think it's a great thing to do, even for yourself. If you look back and go, wow, I wrote that a year ago. Why would I do that in that space? Okay. You're going to know better. <laughs> yeah. You know you'll have some better. insight. Some, some, you said the wisdom. You'll have, be able to answer that question. Like, why would I do that? I love that question because when I did that with my mom, I thought, well, okay, what's my situation? I'm my mom. Well, I'm married to a guy I hate and he's abusive and he drinks and I can't wait for the relationship to be over and I probably want him to die. I'm just being honest, going into this thought process that my mom has. And you know what? I hate my life. I really hate my life. 
So what I'm going to do, instead of being internal, accessing those emotions, I'm going to be external and continue talking and continue talking and continue talking because as soon as I go internal, it hurts. Yeah. And I hate it and I don't like the feeling. I don't want to, I don't want to feel that way. So I'm going to go external and keep talking. And if I, hey, if I talk about the clouds, if I talk about the movies, if I talk about what I did yesterday, then I never have to access the internal. Because I do that enough when I'm alone, and I probably talk to myself a lot when I'm alone because I don't want to go internal. Yeah. And, and there might even be, you know, if she was talking to you and you were a kid and she's able to control that conversation, there might be an aspect of I can't really control things in other areas or I don't feel like I can. I can control this with my son who's... He's not going to, what, talk back, talk over me. And so there might have been that aspect of it as well. But the whole process that you did was awesome. I haven't thought about it in that respect of her having control in that scenario where she wouldn't have control, say, in her marriage. So to be able to maybe it was a way for her to express herself and be herself. That's part of it. But it was still draining to me as a kid because I didn't oh, yeah. know how to deal with it. But I, the only reason I said that is because of what we're talking about regarding how we process uh, people's issues in their life, people's challenges, and where we go in our mind. And that is some place I go in my mind is if I were Jennifer, why would I do that? And I think it's a great uh, process to do on yourself, even if you are yourself, <laughs> because you can look at it, like Matthew was saying, uh, from kind of a dissociated standpoint where, okay, if I weren't me and this was my best friend, if this was my mom, if this was my dad, if this was my partner, whatever, what, I, what advice would I give them? And I'm gonna just going to read the, the rest of this email so we can actually tackle it a little bit. Uh, how can I change to be more patient and find fulfilling friendships and intimate relationships? I would be ever so grateful for your reply. So, you know, I, I look at that and I go, oh, how can I change? I focus in on that. There's some question there. Yeah. To be more patient, um, indicating to me that she feels she's not patient. So she already knows there's an issue, a, a place in her life where she doesn't feel patient. Yeah. Okay, so if I have these terrible relationships and I'm not patient enough, how do I practice patience? You know, I look at present moment thinking. I look at meditation. Um, one of the places I go to when somebody says I'm not patient is to practice listening and observing. If you don't want to meditate, if you don't care about the present moment, if you're not into any of that stuff, um, even though a lot of this is sort of a meditation and present moment, um, when you become an active listener and just listen and really want to know more about what the person's saying and more about what the person's saying, even practicing this, even if you don't want to know, but practicing it and saying, wow, what happened next? Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, my God, that happened to me, too. Now, let me tell you this story. It's going to take me a half an hour to tell it. And you haven't even they haven't even gotten it out of their system. I, I've had clients that haven't stopped talking in their life because we think what we have to say is important. I understand that. We think what we have to say is valuable. I understand that. Maybe we don't think we're valuable. Maybe we don't think we're worthy. And talking is a way to get attention. And that gives us a feeling of worth and significance. And if we carry the idea that that's the only way to get worth and significance, then we're going to continue talking and trying to get attention. I mean, that's a great point. You know, what you just said, that if, if that's how you feel, if that's where you get worthiness and significance from, then you might just talk and dominate conversations you know we had um my, my girlfriend and i have or had we we went with a friend once where she did dominate the conversation and we were with another friend that we wanted to talk to because this friend was leaving town and stuff but this other friend was dominating the conversation about things we really didn't care about and um, maybe y'all can relate to that yes <laughs> well I told my girlfriend, I was like, when you're in that situation, uh, the question I want to ask the person is, do you care if, whether I was interested in what you're saying or not? I mean, that would be a good question. Would you care if I was interested or not in your conversation? I forget how I worded it, but that was sort of like that. Would it even matter to you if I was interested in your conversation or this subject matter? Because you haven't stopped talking. We don't say those things because it can come off rude and confrontational. But I, I often wonder if the person I'm talking to actually cares if I care. <laughs> yeah yeah 
So I look at that and I go, okay, so I've been in this conver- I've been in this type of conversation where someone nonstop talks and, you know, my mom, I have that reference. Uh, my girlfriend, when I first met her, did that a lot. I was like, oh, this is interesting. And so I'm immediately analyzing, going, aha, she must have problems in her life. And she is like, you know, I told her this. And she's like, what the F are you talking about? Just because I like to talk doesn't mean I have problems in my life. And uh, yeah, like there could be so many reasons why somebody wants to dominate a conversation. Maybe they're nervous. I think that happens. You know, you just, you talk and talk and talk and talk because you feel nervous and anxious and you got to fill the, fill the space. I've done that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have a tendency to be on my show. Like when I did interviews. I feel like like you did. You might have that listener said you dominated that conversation. I have felt like I, I better fill in the space because people are listening and they don't want dead air. And yeah. if I don't fill in the space, even now I'm talking, I could probably make stuff up and make it sound a little bit smart and <laughs> referencing stuff that I know. Uh, but every now and then I have to take a break and go, hmm, let me think about that for a moment. Like I said, where I was going with this email is stepping into a why would I do that space I think is so important. And the reason I mentioned about dominant conversational style is that when you are in that space, then it's something that you said on one of our first episodes having to do with uh, the seven habits, uh, Stephen Covey, where he goes, seek to understand before. Oh, my gosh. That's such a huge. Trying to be understood. Yeah. Talk about a habit to, to practice. Yes. Where you're just, you know, the goal of the conversation is to understand the other person and for them to feel understood before you try to get your point across, before you try to share. Because I think that's that's part of effective communication. And I, I've gone through this with uh, conflicts with my sisters where we were on two opposite ends of, of you know, a subject mm. and, or a scenario. And... I wanted nothing more than them to get where I was coming from. I just wanted them to understand where I was coming from, why I chose what I chose, why I said what I said. And going into that situation with that goal in mind, and an hour and a half later being frustrated as heck because we just butted heads the whole time because all both of us wanted to do was talk, Hmm. not listen. And then trying that seek to understand before being understood and going into the conversation and this time saying, okay, I just want to understand why you're so angry. Wow. I'm, I want to understand why this emotion's coming at me. That's coming from you. You, you asked That's her. me doing that and, and even getting obnoxious to it to the point where I was like, my sister's name is Dana. I'm like, Dana, so what I'm hearing you say is like you get frustrated when I do X, Y, Z or when I say that it makes you feel to the point where she's like, stop being so robotic <laughs> because I'll, that's what I was doing. So, so you just so kept let repeating me, back to her. Well, because that's how I was trying to, in my, in, in this, this role of seeking to understand, that's the best way I knew how to do it. Now I'm a little bit more finesse with it, <laughs> but it was still me adopting this new tactic and trying it on. And ultimately it did work because once she felt understood, once we got past the roboticness of it, she felt understood. Then I was like, cool. Can I share what's coming from my end? And she's like, yeah. Okay, now wow. we can actually talk. Because before, it's just button heads. Because button egos, that's what it is. Yeah. It's button egos. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because the idea of you wanting to get the word out and you wanting to tell your side and you wanting to, I don't know, were you also saying you know how wrong she is or how right you are? or Oh, both. both. It, and, and it was... We disagreed on how to handle a situation. Mm. And so I felt that I was correct and I felt that she was incorrect. So it was both. But I also think that what allowed those conversations to ultimately work was that at least one person wanted some sort of resolution, wanted something to happen to come from these conversations. Uh, There has to be a bigger why with at least one person. If Mm. two people don't care, ultimately don't care about the relationship, then who the heck cares? Like, yeah. it's just going to go around in circles and, you know, you can part ways. But, you know, I wanted it and I was very clear on what I wanted and she was clear on what she wanted. And so we were willing to come to the table and endure a number of unproductive conversations, <laughs> ineffective conversations to get to one or two that actually allowed us to break some ground. So, I mean, with Jennifer, 
then you know you you have these you talk about interrupting people in conversations where you want to have input you know i i think do you want to understand where the other person's coming from like why are you in these conversations who are these people that you're interrupting i'm assuming it's folks that it's your loved ones it's you know the people that you are friends with or you want to have those intimate relationships with so then i think there you can connect with the bigger reason for why you might adopt a seek to understand mentality the next time you get in those conversations and i tell you what seek to understand has been a a huge part of everything i do everything oh, of course as a coach yeah i mean of course as, as a coach but also as a human being also as people because we want we want to be heard i think it was already mentioned probably one of the most important things in your email that i extrapolate did I use that word twice already? Uh, <laughs> is the idea of wanting to be heard, wanting the attention, needing to know that you matter. You know, there yeah. might have been a lot of invalidation in your life, or maybe your mom or your dad or someone important in your life just didn't listen to you or squelched you or, you know, put you down for expressing yourself. And now you feel like, I need to get it all out and I need to be heard and I need to, you know, this gives me validation. This makes me feel like I'm meaningful and important. All of these things. So you want to feel, this is my, this is my final uh, suggestion for you. And I'll let you do as well, Matthew. If you're going into a space of wanting to feel heard, liked, important, then I think the best step for you to take is just to become very curious and fascinated with other people. And when you become curious and fascinated with other people and their stories, then you tend to ask questions. Then you tend to show them that you are interested in them because you know what happens is when someone dominates a conversation and they don't allow the other person to talk too much or they're interrupting a lot is that you get into a space of I care more about myself than you. And it's very selfish. I'm not saying you're doing that. I'm not saying you are that way. But to everyone else, this is the message they get. And, I, and you may even think this because you wrote wanting to change this about yourself. But having that thought of if I cared more about this person than myself, I'm always I'm into self-compassion, absolutely. But when you want to change something about yourself, you sort of have to go to the opposite extreme sometimes. So, so if I'm always self-absorbed and I'm always talking and I'm always talking, how do I go the extreme opposite? What if I started listening? Well, that's going to be hard because I want to talk about something. One of the things I do when I want to say something because I know it's important. I know people are going to be impressed. This is in a group of people that I might be talking with. Uh, I stop and ask myself, is it really that important? In the grand scheme of everything that exists, if I was on Pluto looking at Earth, is that one thing so worldly, phenomenally important that it's going to change everything? I really minimize myself. I do it on purpose. Because is it so important that I need to interrupt this person? I need to make this story known. And I practice that. And I go, is it really that important that I say this? Is it really important that this person knows this information? And I go, well, maybe I just need to step back and understand that everything I say is not that important. Ah, that hurts. <laughs> I don't like that feeling. But at the same time, uh, it helps me understand that when I am always trying to espouse my wisdom or my knowledge, I need to know for myself where it's coming from. Do I think I know it all? Do I think that I have all the answers? And if I choose to say, well, yes, yes, I do, then I'm going to become important and dominating. It's a fine balance. I, I realize it is. It's a fine balance between sharing, talking to other people, and listening. But I do believe, my final thought, is that you go into the opposite extreme. If you're always talking, then turn it into always listening, and then go from there, and you'll find what I look, like to look at as the pendulum swing or the big clock pendulum swinging is that it, you're on one side of the pendulum swing and you're talking and talking and talking. What's the other side look like? Listening and silence. And then, eventually, you can talk a little bit and then listen a little bit. And then as I'm motioning my hand, it balances in the center. And you come to a space where you understand 
what you need to do next. So thank you for writing that, Jennifer. I'm going to leave the final words with Matthew, and then we can wrap this up. I liked what you said about asking yourself that question when you feel you want to jump in and interject and insert something, and how for you, you, you kind of take a step back and you minimize yourself. I found that I do something similar, and because there's many times in, in your final words, I wanted to jump in a couple of times, right? And I asked myself, is this for me? Is this about me, or is it about them? Because when I feel the tendency to interrupt and interject, it's because it's about me. Mm. And I want to talk about me. I want to share my story because ultimately I want to look smarter. I want to look more capable. I want to get praise. I want to get recognition. Mm. And so I turn and make it about me. So what I've found is that I'll do that. And so what I end up doing now is I'll ask myself when I have that urge, is this about me or is it about them? Nine times out of ten, it's about me, so I keep my mouth shut. Hmm. And I recognize that I don't need that to make myself feel better. Wow. So that, that was just my follow-up to your closing. And Jennifer, my, my final thoughts, you know, I really want to address the question that you asked in your email. How can I change to be more patient and find fulfilling friendships and intimate relationships? Um, I absolutely agree with Paul that if you're on one side of that spectrum and you find yourself always talking doing the pendulum swing to the other side to be always listening is a great thing to try out because you talked about wanting fulfilling relationships. Now, I believe a, a great place to find fulfillment is from within. And one of the things that I have done personally to create fulfillment in my relationships is to give to others. That's something that I can always control. I can control how much I give and pour out onto others rather than controlling how much people pour out and give to me. So if you're seeking fulfillment in your friendships and in those intimate relationships, you know, what Paul suggested with listening, that is an absolute way to find that fulfillment, to create that fulfillment, because through listening, you're making a deposit into another person. And so by you making that deposit, by you loving on that other person, you will start to feel a sense of fulfillment particularly if this is an important person in your life. And you can even get to a point where you can make deposits in people who you don't know. You know, it, it might be somebody who you just pass on the street and you can still get a sense of fulfillment from that. But for your particular situation, making those deposits into other people can be extraordinarily fulfilling. And if, if you create that fulfillment by depositing in other people, then you start to do that more and more. And guess what? People start to open up more to you. People start to, you know, let their own guards down. People, you know, like you talked about people not investing their time in you. You mentioned that. Well, when you are investing your time, your energy, your love, holding the space for other people, the right people start to do that back to you. You know, those people who are in your life for... To, to enhance your life, start to do that same thing back to you. So that's when you start to feel the fulfillment from your actions because you are fulfilled in the act of pouring your love onto other people and you get fulfillment when they receive it and pour it back onto you. And so pouring that love and making those deposits, I know I use words like that, but to give some concrete examples, it looks like what Paul said, listening. You know, it looks like seeking to understand in a conversation. So you asking questions, you know, you asking those questions to get more information, to, to probe a little bit. And, not, you know, we're not, you're not doing that in any, any way that they might find uncomfortable, but you're asking questions out of a genuine interest to learn more about what's going on, to, to seek that state of empathy, to really feel what they're feeling. And so... You know, you're listening, you're seeking to understand by asking questions. And by doing that, you're having more patience because you're holding that space. You're creating a space and, and you're creating a sense of trust. And you talked about intimate relationships. One of the things that I've experienced that really creates intimacy in relationships is when there's high levels of trust. And Jennifer, a great way of building trust with another person is making those deposits. So you see how it all comes full circle. So I think that by taking just 
even a little bit of what Paul and I have been saying and applying it, you would start to see shifts in not only how you feel in these relationships and, and the ultimate levels of fulfillment you get, but in how people then respond to you, behave towards you, seek you out, and ultimately end up making those deposits back into your tank. So I would, I would uh, love if you shared with Paul, if you emailed Paul after you had a chance to listen to this, digest what we had to say, and try it on. I would love to hear how it worked for you. Did it work? Did it not work? What parts did you find effective or ineffective? And um, yeah, just kind of keep us in the loop. That would be a beautiful thing. Well said, Matthew. Thank you so much. And um, I do want to say this. When, when I learned to be a guest on a podcast, that was a great experience for me because my first podcast, I think I mentioned this on the air, my first podcast as, as a guest on someone else's show um, I talked and talked and talked. I felt like I needed to espouse all my wisdom and every single answer that I possibly can espouse. And, and uh, I thought, okay, so I need to change something. So I became, and this is what's happening with you, Jennifer, is that you are becoming consciously aware that you do need to practice something a little different. And after I was a guest on that episode and I talked and talked, and I heard myself and I was so, I was cringing. I was like, oh my God, I don't even give him a chance to ask questions. I, this is, it took a lot of practice. This was not easy to practice summing up, condensing, and really getting to the point in everything I say. And even now, even right now as I talk, just trying to realize that I need to sum this up. I need to condense this. <laughs> I need to get to the point so that we can move on, so I can move my car out of the space so I don't get a $25 ticket. That is practice. It's always practice. So just continue to be aware of that, that it, it's a practice thing. You, you may not be able to get it right the first 100 times, but 101, suddenly you realize, oh, wow, I have a good balance. We're interacting. I'm interested in what he or she has to say, and they're interested in me. Making those deposits, like Matthew said, I think Matthew summed it up well. Thank you, as always, for um, having the time to do this with me. I am uh, happy to connect with you and, and talk about this stuff and help people if we can and um, get things moving in their life, too. So, Oh, this is awesome. I appreciate you, Paul, for creating this uh, this venue and for us to to talk and dive into stuff because I can relate to, to you, Jennifer, and what you're sharing. And I think that's the coolest thing is to be able to see myself in all of the emails that we that we tackle. Yeah. And um, yeah. plus we get a cool soundtrack to go in the background <laughs> here in this awesome coffee shop that we set up in. Yes, we didn't hear a dog today, but we heard a train whistle. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I appreciate you joining Matthew and I today. I want to thank our sponsor, Casper. You can get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com forward slash brain. Use the promo code brain at checkout to get the discount. Terms and conditions apply. And also something else about Casper. After you're done listening to this episode, check out Casper the podcast sponsored by Casper. It's an entire podcast about Casper. Sponsored by Casper Meta. Available now on Apple Podcasts. If you don't know what I mean, look it up. And I want to thank the patron supporters. If you go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com, you can support this show. It's a way of giving back if you've received value. And it's also a way to get a bunch of episodes you've never heard. There's private episodes, there's workbooks, there's a video archive. And you get all of it when you join the program. So check it out, patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And thank you, existing patron members. I appreciate you. You keep the show running. And thank you to those who use the Amazon link at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Anytime you shop at Amazon through the link at theoverwhelmedbrain.com, Amazon sends us pennies on the dollar. And that is another way to help support the show as well. And that's an international link. So if you're in a different country other than the U.S., it should work. 
at least with the bigger countries out there. I, I don't have any control over that. <laughs> and I'd like to tell you about the mean workbook. If you're in a relationship that just seems too difficult, you got to wonder, why is this so difficult? Isn't this supposed to be easier? Aren't we supposed to get along and hold hands and stare into each other's eyes lovingly and share wonderful experiences? If you don't feel that way, if it's too difficult, if you feel bad more than you feel good, if your partner wants you to feel bad, there might be some emotional abuse going on, and I really don't want you to be in that situation. And if you don't know you're in that situation or not, go to loveandabuse.com and you'll see the Mean Workbook. Mean Workbook is going to help you assess your relationship and give you some tools and resources to get through the difficulties and hopefully make things easier. A truly emotionally abusive relationship is not easy at all. I mean, there's a lot of guilt, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of emotional struggle, and I don't want you to be in that space. So that's why I created this workbook, and it may be helpful to you. Loveandabuse.com And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And like I said, thanks for joining us. Uh, One of the things that we talked about was language and communication and how we communicate. You know, there's a lot of loaded words out there. And one word can mean so many things. Like in this episode, I talked about the word sad. Like sad can mean so many things. And even nowadays, there's the um, urban dictionary like, that's just sad. It's not even the same meaning that we, uh, a lot of us put on it. Sad could mean that's a sad paint job. <laughs> but these, this is what happens over time is that words take on different meanings. You know, words are so context dependent that you can say one word like run and use it a million different times in a million different ways, uh, all depending on the context. So I can't imagine, you know, at least in the English language, how difficult it is for someone learning the English language to go, what? You have 46 definitions for the word run? What? (laughs) That may be like that for other languages too. I don't know. But uh, the reason I mention that is because, uh, you know, as a coach, I, I listen to words, I listen to language, and I have to be sure that what the client is speaking about is in the context of what makes sense. If they say, you know, my mom yells at me and that makes me sad. That's a very ambiguous comment. It sounds like we might know what it means. Oh, your mom yells at you. It makes you sad. That must make you feel bad because she's your only mom. And if a mom yells at you, that might make you feel less valuable, uh, less important. It could be any of those things. It could be uh, something else completely different. It could be when my mom yells at me, uh, I feel sad because it reminds me of how my dad used to yell at me. I mean, it could be that. That might be a little strange to someone, but to that person, it's probably exactly what it is, which is why it's so important to listen to your own language, listen to other people's language, and don't automatically assume that you know what they're saying. And that can be difficult because we assume. We have to assume just to continue our conversation so we don't get stopped up at every juncture of language, at every juncture of a word. One word can have many meanings, and then the meaning that we apply to it may not be the same meaning that somebody else applies to it. So if you find yourself in a position where you're listening to someone and they're sharing uh, that they're in some sort of emotional space or uh, having some challenge, the idea is to drill into what they're saying. I mean, at least this is my perspective, my process. I drill into what they're saying. Oh, you're sad. What makes you sad? Well, my mom yells at me. But what specifically makes you sad about your mom yelling at you? And they look at you funny. What do you mean? If your mom yelled at you, wouldn't you be sad? And I would say yes, maybe for different reasons. But why are you sad that your mom yells at you? And then they'll get into some deeper stuff. And they still may be at the surface of what they mean. You know, when my mom yells at me, it reminds me when I was a kid. And when she yelled at me because I did something wrong and I knew I did something wrong. So I felt like she didn't love me. And so I would say, wow, okay, let's drill into that. You not feeling loved makes you feel sad. Well, of course it does. I want to feel loved. I want to know that my mom loves me. Well, why does not feeling love make you sad? That sounds like a stupid question, but it's a good question. Because it's going to reveal more meaning, more reasons under the surface. 
you may know it. You may do a mind read and go, I know exactly why it makes them sad. But that's not the point. You need to let them speak about what makes them sad. I mean, you don't have to. I'm not saying that you have to be the coach. You have to be the people helper here. I'm just saying it helps to be that kind of friend that can help somebody else reveal what's under the surface. If they want to go there, they may just, they may not want to. And you have to respect that. And they may be upset. And now you have to be their shoulder to cry on. And you may not be prepared for someone who gets upset. I don't know. So, you know, that's why therapists have their job and friends have their job. We all have our place in the world. But, you know, sometimes you have to be a friend and sometimes your friend doesn't know exactly what's causing the problem, what's making them feel so bad, and they just can't figure it out. And then suddenly you ask a question like, well, what specifically about your mom yelling makes you feel sad? And then they have an answer. Wouldn't that be amazing if suddenly they had an answer? Because so many of us go through life without the answer. Where's the answer? Whoa, you just asked me the right question. Sometimes it takes the right question. And uh, don't worry if you don't have the right questions. They'll come. And if they don't, just keep your mind open so that you can step into your power. This will help you with the questions. It'll also help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Okay, I'm not going to say that. Uh. <laughs>